Welcome to the third Mall County Wellness Center's webinar. In a few minutes, Dr. Ann McRae is going to begin her presentation. Um, this presentation this time is Plants and Animals, What is the Role of Nature in Recovery-Oriented Programming? Um, but first, a few things. Um, you've probably all heard this before, but um, you are all currently muted. Um, Dr. McRae will pause on a regular basis to ask for questions. So if you want to ask a question, you can either type it into the question box or click on the end that's next to your name, and that will alert us to take you off mute so that you can ask your question. Uh, you should have all received materials for today's webinar um, via email either yesterday or today. Um, we're having some problems with um, email with servers rejecting the um, the file because it's too large. So if you don't have them, um, write me an email or write in the question box, and I'll try and get it to you. Um, we're recording this webinar, and it will be posted on the CIMH website soon. We'll send you a link to the recording when it's available. And thank you. And now I'll turn it over to Anne. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to new people. And for people who have done webinars with me before, welcome back. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'll just do a brief introduction. This is the uh, third third year I've been doing webinars for um, CIMH. I really enjoy them a lot. Uh, I am an occupational therapist, and I'm also a project consultant. Uh, I am partially retired at the as from San Jose State University. I still teach uh, occupational therapy, but only to post professionals online all over the world, which is a lot of fun. Um, and I get to live up in my mountain home up in Trinity County, where I uh, also uh, work for Trinity County Behavioral Health Services. So I am part of the small county network, and uh, my work at, uh, at Trinity County involves both direct uh, clinical care on the mental health side but also as a project consultant for the uh, MHSA side, um, uh, Milestones and Horizons Wellness Centers, which has been an absolute blast. So I get to do a lot of collaboration and innovative things. So it's been really great to be part of these uh, webinars and share some of those ideas. You'll notice on this uh, opening slide that I do list my email. Uh, I think I list it on the final slide as well. Anytime you uh, want some follow-up or some more information you need or a question comes up after the webinar that you didn't think of at the time, please always uh, feel free to contact me. Okay, ready to go? All right. Oh, it's going to do this. Sometimes when I go online here, it doesn't do my regular way of moving slides, so I think I got it. Okay, this slide basically lists the objectives. I always include in objectives. Uh, I guess I've been trained as a professor too long. <laughs> um, to, and it, this is your way of holding me accountable that I do indeed cover what I say I'm going to cover. Uh, I'm not going to read all these. They're for you. But uh, just to kind of summarize them, um, these objectives support the rather common sense idea that being around nature and plants and animals are intrinsically healthy. Um, what has changed in recent years is rather just depending on our common sense or intuition, there is now actually a, a fair amount of specific scientific evidence that shows that being involved in the natural world is both physical and mentally healthy, uh, both in terms of prevention and keeping yourself healthy, but also restorative or, or rehabilitative, if you will. Um, it, uh, it can help you lead a healthier uh, wellness-oriented life. Uh, however, there are some real challenges uh, when including aspects of the natural world into a wellness center, either in a location or in a program. So in this session, we're going to explore both the benefits and limitations of using nature for wellness, as well as starting to think through the, the planning and the legal compliance issues of, of having natural world aspects into your location or program. So that kind of summarizes what we're going to try and accomplish today. 
I think we should start off with how, what am I talking about when I say the natural world. Uh, the natural world includes various types of living plants as well as domesticated animals such as pets, uh, as well as wild animals, rocks, forests, beaches. In general, the, when we talk about the natural world, we're talking about those things that have not been substantially altered by human intervention or which persist despite attempts at human beings to change them. Um, as I mentioned, in this particular webinar, we're primarily going to focus on plants and animals, but I'm also you know, going to give some um, examples and at least lip service to the idea of going out into the, uh, the wild world, if you will, you know, forests, beaches, nature, that kind of thing. So natural world covers a whole lot. Y'all with me so far? Any questions on the objectives or the um, definition? Okay, that's all pretty straightforward. Hopefully as we move on and I ask some tougher questions, uh, we'll, we'll get some uh, conversation going. Okay. Um, why should wellness centers be concerned with the natural world? And here's one I'm, I'm going to challenge you and please give me some responses. Here's, here's my answer. The interaction with nature has to be conscious or intentional because our society has changed to be more and more disconnected from nature. Do you think that's true? And if so, can you tell me why that might be true? Why do we have to pay conscious attention to including nature? Isn't it just there? Uh, are we more disconnected as a society from nature now? What do you think? Do you disagree with me? Anyone going to chime in? Nobody is responding yet. Think about what's different now than was a hundred years ago, say. Okay, we got a shy group. Well, I will answer why I believe this. You can disagree. Um, I think it's true because there's been an overwhelming and frankly exponentially increasing dependency on technology and media. Think about lives today as opposed to 100 years ago. We have cell phones, laptops, tablets, computers, digital music, GPS, internet, cable and satellite TV. I mean I can go on and on. Um, and this has been true I'd say particularly the last 10 or 15 years especially for young urban people. But what's kind of shocked me when I moved up here to Trinity County, I've been here about six years now, is that even in this very rural area, um, and even with people, or older people, you know, not just youngsters anymore, uh, this dependency on technology has gotten, um, in some cases, rather extreme. Uh, and it's funny, when I talk to people who grew up here, um, they never had television growing up uh, in a lot of the more mountainous areas because you couldn't even get the networks on the old analog TV. But with, with the addition of satellites and um, cables, uh, everybody pretty much anywhere in this country, unless you really, really are in the wilderness, you can be connected to technology. Uh, and it's getting more and more so. Now, I don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not against technology at all. Obviously, I use it a lot, and it has tremendous benefits, even therapeutically. However, one belief that I hold true over a lot of things is that I think it's important that everybody consider that there may be unintentional or negative consequences um, for a lot of things that change. And we don't always think that through. We can see the benefits, but not necessarily the unintentional consequences. And I think that is especially true for wellness uh, and the overuse or overdependency on technology. So that's one of the reasons. I'm just giving you some background here. One of the reasons why I felt it was important for us to talk about, um, you know, things like nature and animals and wellness and what role uh, animals and plants and what role it plays with wellness. Any comments? Okay. <clears throat> so the next slide is how is the natural world related to the philosophy of wellness and recovery? 
those of you who have participated in past webinars with me know that I've often used these eight dimensions of wellness as they were defined by SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health uh, Service Agency by the federal government. Um, that I think they make a very nice um, structure or organizational tool to look at all aspects of wellness. And uh, for those of you who have not seen this before, um, I can send you a, a small PDF of the wellness poster that has all these things, uh, or you can get a, a free and large full-size poster free from the SAMHSA website. And just type in eight dimensions of wellness and order it and they can send it to you free. It's a very cool uh, poster. But anyway, let's go through these eight dimensions in relations to examples from the natural world. There's more than this, but I'm just giving examples of how it works. Uh, how do you address the emotional dimension of wellness from nature? Well, it can be used as coping strategies, such as taking walks or developing uh, outdoor hobbies. Uh, for a lot of people, they report a very calming effect of being uh, out in nature. Uh, so it's clearly a, a connection there. Uh, the second dimension of wellness as defined by SAMHSA is financial. Um, I think it's kind of obvious that if you're out doing natural th things in the natural world, there's a lot less te temptation to spend money. Um, taking a, a, a hike up a mountain, um, you can spend a lot less money than if you took a walk in a mall. Uh, so uh, it's, it's financially uh, beneficial. Okay, the third dimension uh, of wellness as defined by SAMHSA is social. Uh, being involved with uh, the natural world uh, gives you lots of opportunities to join clubs or share hobbies. I know a lot of people who uh, their primary socialization is taking their dog for a walk in the park and meeting other dog owners. Uh, something as simple as that. Uh, it's also a great venue for friend and family gatherings or dates. Um, I know uh, clients that I've worked with have often reported feeling lonely or wanting a girlfriend or, or whatever. And uh, I remember one young man in particular said that he was too shy to ask someone for a date because he had no money to take him to dinner. And I said, why don't you ask her to go for a hike? <laughs> and it was like the idea had never even occurred to him. You know, so there are uh, plenty of opportunities to increase social contact. Um, through through um, through nature, um, joining an organization like the Sierra Club, you know, which does a, you know planned hikes in various places, things like that, uh, can be great. Or just having a picnic with your family uh, can be truly wonderful. So I, I certainly see a strong connection to increasing socialization uh, by using things from the natural world. Okay, the fourth dimension is uh, in by SAMHSA, defined by SAMHSA, is spirituality. Um, being involved with, with nature, whether you're taking care of plants or, or animals or just being out uh, in the country, um, I think really does help us feel more connected, um, find our place in the world, make us part of something. And uh, spirituality, as defined by SAMHSA, is a very broad thing. It is not the same as religion. Uh, it is things that give our lives meaning and purpose. Uh, and being uh, directly in contact with nature, I think, tends to do that. And there's a lot of talk about this, and it almost sounds kind of metaphysical, but uh, being involved in, in nature gives one a sense of a place, not just in the world, really in the universe. And interestingly, the very next webinar I'm doing next month is on spirituality uh, and, and wellness, so this is just a little precursor. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, okay, the fifth one is uh, occupational. This can certainly mean paid or volunteer employment opportunities. Um, and again, some people who, particularly if they don't have a lot of schooling, can find opportunities um, to be a trail worker or any number of things uh, uh, in the environment. Um, there's also a lot of volunteer opportunities working uh, in community gardens and in um, uh, places like the ASPCA will train volunteers or, or animal shelters of various kinds, sometimes train volunteers. And it's a, it's a great self-esteem booster, you know, to feel that you're part of something, paid or volunteer. 
uh, but also occupational, not just as employment, but occupational as how you occupy your time. Being involved uh, in the natural world gives one um, a sense of self. And what I mean by role identity is, is think about it yourself. How do you define yourself? Uh, I am a, quote, hiker. I am a bird watcher. I am a miner. Actually, a lot of the people up here in Trinity County, we have a lot of you know, gold panning, things like that. And that is part of someone's role identity. I am a fill in the blank. Um, those are all occupations, whether they're employment or not. So that's a huge part of wellness, is to have that sense of self, uh, that role identity. Okay. Um, physical. Well, I think just by definition, natural world hobbies or occupations pretty much all require some form of exercise or activity. Uh, now, I'm not just talking about hiking out in the wilderness. Uh, if you, even in your home uh, or inside in the wellness center, if someone's responsible for uh, taking care of uh, pets or taking care of plants, you got to get up and water them, you've got to get up and feed them or do whatever and having that level of responsibility uh, although it seems modest actually does increase your uh, physical activity and therefore your physical well-being. Okay the next one is intellectual. Um, there are a lot of ways that you can expand your knowledge, skills and creative outlets uh, and by definition of that SAMHSA uses, you know, intellect isn't just schooling. Intellect requires a lot of different parts of the brain being active. And part of that is creativity, uh, being able to express oneself. Uh, you know, for example, one of the things I used to love to do is to bring groups out somewhere, you know, to a lake or a stream or a, a mountain uh, with sketch pads. And uh, it gives you a chance to express yourself and a, a, a chance to build your uh, knowledge and skills and your observations uh, so that it is uh, being involved in nature can be very intellectually stimulating. Uh, also what tends to happen on the intellectual level is if you are responsible for something, whether it is an animal or a plant, there is motivation to learn more about it. So uh, you, you have to learn how much do I feed a puppy or how do I do, uh, uh, how do I not have my plants die all the time, or, you know, what kind of fertilizer do they need, or, you know, whatever. So it is a, a way of stimulating intellectual curiosity because you are motivated to do so. And the last one is environmental, which uh, kind of nature is an environment, you know, but it's pretty well agreed upon that nature can provide a very pleasant and a stimulating environment that does support well-being, that does support wellness. So these are just examples. I would love if I can get some of you to talk to me. Uh, I would love for you to uh, explain or give it other examples from the work that you do. How does anything in either out in the natural world or parts of the natural world that you've brought into your centers um, address these things, these eight dimensions of wellness, any one of them? We have some hands raised. Yay! <laughs> um, Hi. Donna. Donna. Hi. 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 Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay, good. Um, I'm Donna. I'm from Tuolumne County, and we're in the mother load, so we have lots of we live in nature. Mm -hmm. Yosemite is in our county mm -hmm. and um, even though we live here in nature in the gold country we took an outing once just to go pick pick up pine cones to use for crafts which you mentioned here mm -hmm. and um, still this was many years ago and to this day I still hear from our clients how that was their favorite outing and all yep. we did was walk around in the woods and look for pine cones. Yep. And they really enjoyed it because it, there wasn't anything huge being asked of them. Right. And if they didn't want to pick up pine cones, they didn't have to. But they had a good time because they could just walk off in pairs and talk. And um, 
it seemed to just be very relaxing for them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that, that's a that's great, a great one, one to one share, Donna. Uh, uh, because, because uh, uh, oh, actually, actually, can you unmute you know, this? Because I'm getting a, a rebound. Shoshana? Yeah, got it. Okay. Uh, Donna, if you want to come back on and answer me, she can, you know, um, unmute it again. But it was just getting a rebound effect. I want to follow up on your example because that is exactly why I decided this webinar was important because I also am in a rural area and as I said it shocked me that even people who have nature all around them our lives have changed in a way that we just don't do those things as much anymore which you know some people do of course but a lot of the clients that I see a lot of the members in the wellness centers really don't um, and it's 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 free, it's there, it's available, so why aren't we doing more of this? And I, So I would encourage the wellness centers, even if you are in an area like uh, Donna's in or like I'm in, uh, to uh, create some structured opportunities to do this because I've had the same experience with Don as Donna had. I've, I hear about, you know, when we do these kind of things, um, you hear about it for a long time. It is very special and in fact I have a plan coming up in the spring um, once the wildflowers come up, we're going to, I'm going to take a group out and uh, collect a bunch and then do, a, I have a flower press, so we dry them and then uh, make other crafts for them, like note cards and stuff. But really, you know what the best part of that is? It's going out and getting them, the wildflowers. <laughs> uh, and then the rest of it you do back in the center. But things like that are just really very, very special. And I honestly believe I wouldn't have done this presentation and I certainly wouldn't be showing you this slide if I didn't believe that these examples from the natural world really do hit all eight of the dimensions of wellness. Was there another comment? Uh, yes, let me... Doctor, is, is it, it's not like cold. Hello? hello? Yes, hello, can you hear me? I'm, I'm talking to you from Inyo County. Hi. How are you? Hi. My name is Christina. And I help operate a wellness center here in uh, Bishop, California. Mm -hmm. I wanted to comment that we have a gardening group every year. We plant uh, different produce and enter it in our Tri-County Fair. Fabulous. And this Fabulous. is a great way to integrate our clients into the community and have them yes. compete and win ribbons. Yep. It's just a fabulous thing, and we look forward to it every year, and they do too. That is so fabulous. And in fact, I'll, as you'll see later on in the webinar, I'm going to talk quite a bit about gardening. But uh, that's a great example. And look how many different areas you hit doing that. Certainly, they're out in, uh, in nature, but they're also learning skills. Uh, they're getting exercise, working in the gardening, uh, socialization by sharing it with others. Uh, occupational, what what a great, uh, you know, role identity to be a ribbon winner at your county fair. I mean, I'm, I have my blue ribbons up in my kitchen. <laughs> I do it myself every year at Trinity County Fair. Yeah. So, uh, you know, things like that really do uh, bolster one's self-esteem. I could go on and on, but that's a, a fabulous example. Thank you for sharing that. Anyone else? Um, there is Amy Broadhurst. Hi, my name is Amy. I'm actually from Alpine County, another rural county in California. And I had a couple comments. Um, we have a, a native population here, the Washoe Tribe, um, mm -hmm. that's here in Alpine County. And mm -hmm. in the fall time, what has been great trips for us is to actually go out gathering. So we've gone willow gathering to make baskets, pine nut gathering, acorn gathering, and it is Although we live in this area and we sometimes have to travel out to do the gathering, mm -hmm. it's a great opportunity for people to come together and, yep. you know, they remember the traditions that were passed down and, you know, yep. stories that they'd heard and they'd never been exposed to it. And now here they are as adults getting the opportunity to do that, to work together. Yes. Um, elderberry, we make jam. And so it's, it's been um, in the last two years, we've done that the last two falls, multiple trips, and that yes. has been very meaningful for the people in our community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Again, the, yeah. other, Go ahead. the other um, ongoing program being that um, we're here in Alpine County, we have Grover Hot Springs State Park, and we've worked closely with the park that we have a 
a senior socialization or senior soak we called on every Monday morning the seniors in, um, can go and it's an outdoor pool if anyone's familiar with Grover Hot Springs it's an outdoor hot pool as well as a cold pool which is like a regular swimming pool and so the, the views and being out in the fresh air and being in the water has been very very uh, much into a wellness lifestyle and there's um, a lot of people that look forward to that as you know, to getting out and, and meeting other people and That's, being I, I involved. I love Grover Hot Springs. Can I come visit sometime? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I love that place. I do too. Are we still on? Yeah. Shoshana, I've lost the audio. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Shoshana? I'm not sure if anyone's hearing me or not because I have lost the oil. We're hearing you. Hear you, Anne. Can't hear us. Anne? Hold on, everyone. Try to get Ann back up. Shoshana? Yeah? Hey, I, do we have everybody back? I lost audio for a while. Yeah. We, okay. We hear you all that time. Oh, okay. I don't know what happened, but I'm glad I'm back. I'm sorry about that. Um, just to uh, answer the person uh, who was from, I guess it's Alpine County, where Grover Hot Springs is. I, I love that place, and I want an invitation to come join you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, also, you highlighted everything that... that uh, I've been talking about and uh, just some wonderful, wonderful examples. Um, I think maybe it would be a, a great idea for uh, those of us who are doing some of these things to uh, put together a, a little booklet of ideas for people. Um, I'm certainly collecting your thoughts as I'm on all of that. Uh, but uh, I think there are some places, even some rural counties, who uh, are not doing these kind of things or not doing them as much as they could. Uh, but even for those of you who, and it sounds like uh, here in Alpine, is it Alpine County? I hope I have that right. Uh, you're doing quite a bit of this. Uh, I'm hoping that this webinar will still benefit you by kind of giving you the, the terminology and the, um, the structure of why this is accepted as part of uh, wellness strategies. We, again, we know that intuitively and you know that from your life experiences, but being able to see this from a health perspective and seeing the publications, which I'm going to start talking about next, gives you a little more uh, extra credibility if you're going to go on for grants or anything like that. So that's one of the reasons in the next couple of slides I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the resources and references that are out there. Uh, anyone else have any examples to share? I love hearing about them. Um, yes. There's yeah, in Sierra County, we are blessed to often see deer grazing right out back of the mental health building, and who could not feel better while enjoying such a view? Uh, same here. I, I'm one of the people who love the deer up here. Um, you know, some people um, get a little jaded. Uh, deer in Trinity County are often seen as either food or a road hazard. <laughs> <laughs> and they are that too, uh, but uh, watching animals uh, in their natural habitat uh, doing their natural things uh, I find is a very calming thing, is, is a very wonderful thing, and very enriching. So I'm glad that um, you enjoy that. That's great. I know one of the things that we kind of touched on, and, and uh, the one from Alpine certainly uh, said this, is 
uh, embedded in the social and spiritual and personal aspects of wellness. They don't tie it out indirectly, is cultural awareness. Uh, and actually, SAMHSA does talk a lot about cultural awareness. Uh, I also live in an area uh, where we have a, a Native American influence. And one of the, the things that we have, we, have, we are very blessed to have uh, a man from the uh, Wintu tribe who is a healer and an herbalist who does uh, herb walks with uh, people from the wellness center as a volunteer and he takes them out and helps them identify uh, all what the uh, native plants are and how they were used for uh, spiritual purposes or medicine or food uh, and he's taught a lot so that's another example of how uh, this is all personal spiritual emotional etc but certainly intellectual he uses this as a teaching opportunity uh, and we're very very uh, fortunate to uh, have him do that for us uh, a couple of times a year, which is really nice. Okay, anything else on this slide? There is one more hand raised. Um, Great. Not sure if we've already, uh, she, you've made the last comment, but um, Linda, did you have more to say? No. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, Wow, thank you very much. We stayed a while on this slide, but I was just so happy that you all decided to chime in and give me some great examples. Uh, and as I said, I am always uh, loving when we have some interaction. I think it makes it uh, much more meaningful to all of us. So feel free to chime in anytime. So as I said, in these next three slides, this one and the two after it, I list a number of references for you to use as resources. But to be honest, not all of these citations contain substantial proof or evidence that is research-based. Some of the sources are editorial or instructional materials related to topics. Uh, they do, however, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to give them to you is that they demonstrate that there's an increased scholarly interest in including nature in a wellness perspective. And hopefully they can provide you with some ideas as well as, as I said before, backup documentation. Uh, if you want to develop and sustain nature-based uh, wellness environments, um, it's always nice to say, you know, hey, this isn't just some, you know, harebrained scheme I have. Look at all this, these publishings publish that uh, support this. Um, and there isn't time for me to go over every reference, but I'm going to highlight a couple per slide. Um, and if you have any specific questions about any of them, um, or of a number of these that I didn't provide you, uh, I actually do have the PDF files of the articles. And if you're interested in hearing more about that, I can certainly send them to you. <clears throat> uh, OK, so this first uh, of the three slides is the natural world. Um, two of the citations listed on this slide are resources that have been sent to you as PDF files. Um, if you haven't received them yet, uh, I, either me or um, Shoshana could send them to you, and I put in parentheses resource provided. And hopefully you already got them, but if you didn't, we can send them to you. And to explain why I sent them, um, let's look at that first one. Uh, the first one is by the American Psychological Association, and the title of it is Beyond Tender Love and Care, um, Promoting Health and Happiness. Um, this uh, pretty short article, it isn't all about nature, but the reason I wanted to include it is because uh, what the article is really about is developing a healthy lifestyle. And uh, the authors um, specifically say that nature is an important part of developing a healthy lifestyle. You know, for example, one quote from the article is, quote, spending time in nature can promote cognitive functions and overall well-being. Now, again, you may be saying, I know that. Uh, but if you're writing a grant or something, being able to cite the American Psychological Association will give your grant more credibility. So uh, it's nice that people like the APA are now coming around saying, oh, yeah, this is an important part of health. Um, another article that was previously sent to you or is available to send uh, is by Dr. Stephen Mitrion. Um, I could have included this one in the slides specific to references, but I put it here because I thought his focus uh, really presented, uh, even though he focuses on gardens, it really presented um, a much wider view uh, of the natural world uh, as a healing uh, component. It's a very nice little piece to read. I like it. Um, one other on this slide I want to mention. I can't send you because it's a whole book. Uh, it's a book by Richard Louvre. 
and it's called The Last Child in the Woods, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder. This is a really lovely book. I love it. Uh, I assure you, nature deficit disorder does not exist in the DSM-4 and will not exist in the DSM-5. Uh, it's not an actual uh, psychiatric diagnosis. However, what Louvre does in this book is uh, really kind of backs up what I was saying earlier about what's happening with our change to being so dependent on technology. Um, and he makes a very compelling case linking a lack of contact with nature uh, to the uh, rapidly rising diagnosis of uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder uh, in children and possibly the uh, an increase in depression and anxiety. Uh, so I think one of the reasons I was very drawn to this book is because it, it talks about when you disconnect uh, from nature in the way we seem to be doing more and more, um, there are consequences and that is just beginning to be explored. So uh, I found it a, a pretty moving book, so I um, can't send you that because it is a whole book, but it's one that I wanted to alert you to. I think it's uh, really kind of interesting. And out of the others that I didn't mention, one of them is an editorial, but again, I think gives some really nice verbiage, you know, that you could share with others. And two of them are actually research studies. Um, and if you're interested in reading research, some people are, some people aren't, uh, I can try and get you those articles. So, is there um, any questions about these citations? Well, actually, there is a um, comment going back to the discussion we had a okay. little while ago. <coughs> and no our in Shasta County winters can be long and it's difficult to be outside. Yes. Last fall, we had planned a fall picnic. It was too cold. So, we used both bands to take a fall color tour. Oh, that's beautiful. Toward Baum Lake and Crystal Lake, we briefly stopped at the fish hatchery to have fun with the fish and eat our picnic lunch. We finished our day touring the fall colors around Lake Britain. We still mm -hmm. talk about how wonderful that trip was. Yeah. See? Yeah, a couple of you have now mentioned this. It said these are memories that stay with people for a very long time. That can tell you how important it was. Uh, to have that connection. And I applaud you for being flexible enough to saying, okay, it's too cold to do what we had planned, let's do something a little different, uh, but still get out there. Um, the other thing, this may sound a little critical, but uh, I, I do think that as a society we have gotten a little bit soft. I hear people say all the time, well, I can't go out, it's too cold. Now, I'm not saying you should stay out for three or four hours or whatever, but a little brisk walk uh, in the snow or cool weather uh, can actually be very invigorating um, and depending on if you have health problems or whatever uh, it is still worth it if you can uh, to to even get out a little bit during the day uh, one of the things I did not really bring up in this uh, webinar but has been uh, researched a lot is seasonal affective disorder um, where when we don't have access to natural light um, if you are prone to it, you, you are much more likely to develop uh, depressive symptoms. Uh, so I do think, even if something is simple, if you can't make it out of the house, if it's just too nasty out there, um, at least open the windows a little bit, get some And we're losing Jeff. And we can't hear you if you're talking. And? Yeah, I don't know what's happening. We can hear you now. Oh, I'm, I do not know what's happening. I actually lost my internet once this morning. So, um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, I don't know where you lost me, so I may repeat myself a little bit. I was talking something I didn't bring up a lot in this webinar, but is worth knowing is uh, about seasonal affective disorder. If you can't make it out of the house because of the cold weather, it's just too nasty out there, it is worth it to, you know, open a window a little bit, get some fresh air in, and absolutely important to open the blinds and get some natural light in. Um, there's a lot of studies that are showing that lack of natural light increases depressive symptoms. So if we, you know, can, and, you know, Try to get people to take a walk in the snow, even just a short while, if they have appropriate clothing. Um, 
in the rain. I remember when I was doing the clinic down in, um, in San Jose, um, I have clients who just absolutely refuse to go out of the house if it was raining, you know, and I spent a lot of time talking to them. It's like, you know, sometimes people had to always go out in the rain to do their job or get food or whatever. It's, uh, you know, I used to tease this one guy in particular. I would say he was the you know, descendant of the Wicked Witch of the West, that if he went out in the rain, he would melt. And then he thought that was kind of funny, and we kind of joked about it. And, you know, so then he realized that it really wasn't a legitimate excuse to constantly miss sessions because it was misting out, you know. So sometimes, again, I don't want to sound too critical, but I do think sometimes we can toughen up a little bit. <laughs> Now, this is not to say the person who just told me that they had to uh, reschedule an outing or change it. Um, I do agree. It could be miserable going out in the snow, and particularly some of us live in counties that do get quite cold. And I'm not suggesting that you drive out in the middle of a snowstorm, but um, I think it is, does help to talk individually to people about uh, still finding ways, even if it's just opening the blinds, to get some nature, almost especially in the full dark days. Any other comments, questions about? Uh, Donna Durgan had her hand up. Donna? Okay. Donna? Hello. Hi. 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 I have a question. You had said something about the about grants. Yeah. What are the grants yeah. for? Oh, I was thinking so specifically about, about program, program development. development. Um, and sometimes you can get like small community grants for supplies and things like that. So if you, you know, say you wanted to start a, uh, um, a garden at the wellness center, uh, you may be able to get a small grant to get the uh, supplies to start that. Um, or you may be actually get a program development grant to, that could even pay for some salary. There's a couple of different aspects of that. Uh, but my experience with grant writing and we have had some past webinars on grant writing, so you may want to uh, uh, go to the archives of CIMH and look at those. But my experience with grant writing is that uh, even in some of the small grants, they want to know, is there any evidence that this is going to make any difference? So um, uh, using sources like this does help. Does that answer your question? Donna? Unmuted. Yes, it does. Thank you. We we have a peer center and we have a garden, um, and actually, th this would be a good thing to help them make their garden a little bigger. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Uh, for uh, things for like things that, like uh, I think the the local community grants, uh, sometimes done by um, like the benevolent associations, like the Rotary Club or things like that, uh, or sometimes by uh, your local chamber of commerce, who uh, or even go directly to the neighborhood nursery. Uh, there's lots of different ways um, that uh, very often that there is money, small pockets of money, is, you know, but for very specific things like that, uh, I think it is worth it to go to your community. Okay, are we ready to move on? Um, yeah. All right. So the next slide was still looking at resources here and references. Uh, is specific about animals. Uh, the citations on this slide actually cover a couple of different aspects of animals and wellness, and uh, one of the subtops of topics is regarding animal-assisted therapy, which has very specific criteria. Uh, I did send you um, this great legal piece um, that talks about uh, the specific differences between psychiatric service dogs and emotional support animals. I would really urge you to read that um, because uh, a lot of people, most people who own dogs, see them as a form of emotional support. Uh, that's not the same as a service dog. There's very specific laws regarding uh, what a service dog is, and I'll talk a little bit more about the um, legal aspects in a little while. Um, but, uh, you know, is it really a service dog? Is it animal-assisted therapy? Uh, there are specific criteria for that that are different than the emotional benefits we get from owning pets, and it has some legal implications. So that's pretty important to know that. Um, but having any animals around us uh, does a couple of really wonderful things, and some of these articles uh, really highlight that. Um, 
when you have an animal uh, as a pet, uh, it fosters an identity. I'm a dog owner or a cat owner. Um, you hear people say, I'm a cat person. Um, uh, it fosters a sense of responsibility. Uh, you have a job to do and because ownership uh, does imply a lot of responsibility. Uh, but you also get something back. The nurturing and healing aspects of, of pets is actually well documented, not just in terms of psychological support, in terms of physical support. There was one great study, uh, I don't have it listed on here because I kind of geared mainly towards uh, mental health. But there was a great study that, that uh, showed how petting a, an animal lowers blood pressure. And I thought, wow, God, our, 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 uh, our need for connection with something outside of us is so important and so much keeps our lives in balance. So um, any questions about the animal ones? Okay, moving on. And the last one here is on gardening. Um, and again, if you did not receive any of these PDA files, um, I didn't send all of these obviously, but some of these I did say resource provided, as in that very first one uh, from the CDC, the Center for Disease Prevention. Um, it's a very short little file, but it lists a whole bunch of health benefits of gardening, but also provides a lot of additional resources, a lot of websites, a lot of things you can write away for. Um, you were also sent one that's not on this slide uh, called the Gardening Tip Sheet. Um, that was developed by the American Occupational Therapy Association, my field. Uh, it wasn't listed on this slide because the tips mainly refer to adaptations for physical health. I sent it to you anyway because, as we've discussed in previous webinars, if you've been on them with me, uh, people with mental illness have a much higher percentage of one or more physical illnesses than the general public. Uh, it is also expected that that percentage of multiple diagnoses is going to rise as our population ages. So my point in sending you this tip sheet is a reminder to always be aware of someone's physical limitations and make sure adaptations or adjustments just are made to an activity such as gardening. And it gives a lot of hints on, on how to do these things safely. Most important with uh, involving in any of these nature-based activities is that you have to make sure you're doing them safely. And because as everything we have talked about so far talks about how Usually it requires some physical input uh, and action to engage in this. Um, safety is a very, very important consideration. You know, for example, you don't want someone throwing their back out when they're working in your, your little garden at your wellness center because, first of all, it certainly isn't good for the person, but there could also be legal implications for things like that. So you do always need to make sure that whatever activities you're doing, you're doing safely. Okay. Uh, so again, here's just some other references for you uh, to, um, to use in whatever way you want. Um, sometimes I think they are inspiring. I, I mean, I talked about their value in, in getting grants or using terminology to explain to others what you're doing. Uh, even if you're not getting grants, most of us have to write some kind of report on our activities at wellness centers. Uh, for MHSA or you know anyone else that supported us, um, and sometimes reading uh, articles or books like this gives you even the little pamphlets gives you the words to explain how what you are doing is addressing wellness uh, and not just you know doing something nice or fun uh, that it clearly is linked to your primary mission, which is wellness. <clears throat> so that's one of the reasons these sources are important. Sometimes I find they're just plain inspirational. You know, if you're thinking about whether you want to do, you know, like a, a garden or something, you know, reading these things kind of gets your juices flowing, gets your ideas going, and inspires you to move forward to it. Okay, any questions about these? No? Okay, let's move on. Okay, so which aspects of nature can be addressed, realistically addressed at the at wellness center? Uh, well, the first one is environmental modifications. You bring nature inside uh, or combine inside and outside spaces. This could be something as simple as having a house plant, <laughs> um, but it's still bringing a piece of nature inside. Um, 
and then having programming that brings people in contact with outside nature. And we've actually already had a lot of examples of this, and I loved it, you know, doing some field trips, doing some walks, uh, whatever. Um, the third point is developing specific programs uh, with rules and policies and procedures related to plant and animals. I'm going to go over this in more depth in a later slide, but this is actually very, very critical uh, to prevent some problems and to make sure you're in legal compliance. Um, and then the fourth point I have there is to educate or encourage group members to include a connection with nature in their everyday lives. Um, not every aspect of wellness happens when people are actually at your center. And sometimes we forget this. Clinicians forget this too. They think they're, you know, two hours a week with someone is, is you know, all that's important. It's not. People live a 24-hour day, seven days a week. So part of our job, whether you're a clinician or whether you're a peer specialist working in a, a wellness center, is to encourage your members um, to take what they're learning and doing in your center, in your session, um, and make it part of their daily lives. That's what really makes a difference. Uh, so, you know, helping people do that on a day-to-day -day basis uh, is sometimes really the best thing we can do. Uh, even if we're not doing it that much or we can't for any number of reasons, we'll talk about later, uh, right in our center. Everybody could do this last one. Everyone can be encouraging our group members uh, of the Wellness Center to include this connection in their daily lives. Can anyone else share an example? We did have a number of examples about the field trips or walks or uh, another specific example of how maybe you're already doing some of this or some questions about anything on this slide, how you can do it. So um, Donna has her Donna? I'm muted. Donna? Hi, we have a our community garden in the back of the Peer Center, and you know the main Peer counselor started the garden, but the clients took ownership of it very quickly. And I tell you what, they got a good crop. They did a really good job. Wow, that's great. Yeah, and I like I don't remember who it was, but somebody had said they took their vegetables to the fair. Mm -hmm. I kind of like that idea. I think that's a, a good idea because we had so much food that came from that garden. It was too much for the people who go to the peer center. Right. So a lot of it just sat on the vine. Um, wow. So, yeah, and the, the clients really took ownership of that. They were very mm -hmm. proud of it. They cook mm -hmm. stuff for us with it. Yep. Um, so, yeah, awesome. the gardening awesome. was a big part of the program this summer. And that's all. Thank you. A, a, a couple of follow-up comments to that. One is, a, yes, I would agree. Uh, get people to enter things in the county, whatever your local county fair is. That's awesome. Um, and sometimes, uh, depending on when your crop comes up, you do have to do things like some canning. Uh, you know, the, the strawberries come up in the spring, and your, your county fair not, may not be till August. If you make some jams, uh, they can still be submitted to the fair. Uh, from this year's crop. Uh, the other thing that I know a, a couple of places have done is when they have an over an abundance in their uh, community garden is they, they set up a network with a local soup kitchen. Uh, we have a, a couple of spots around Trinity County that uh, do provide food and they are more, more than happy to take your excess from your garden um, and be able to distribute it to other people who, who are in need. And again, what a wonderful role for someone. Think of that self-esteem, think of that uh, feeling of inclusion, uh, being part of a community that, you know, you may have uh, very little yourself, but because you were able to be involved in this garden, you can give back to your community. I can't think of anything more healing uh, myself. I, I, I love that kind of stuff. You know, you pay it forward, you know, you're having a little rough, rough time, but so are other people. Uh, so that awareness of, of, of being able to contribute is uh, wonderful. Okay, any other comments on this slide? There are. Okay. Um, Linda? Linda? Yes. Hi. Hi. Oh, I was, I, I typed it in, but maybe you can't see that. 
I was just uh, mentioning that I had planted some leftover seeds from my garden at home in front of the drop-in center here in Sierra County, and it just grew wonderfully, and I was hoping to just kind of inspire others to join in by doing so. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm going to have a lot of help in that little garden this year. All right. Everybody seemed to really like it. All right. That is so cool. Um, and also another thing about planting, uh, it, it's we've, we've focused a lot so far on um, food-related items, but sometimes just think of it in terms of beauty um, and things that don't maybe necessarily require a lot of care. If you have a space outside that's got a little dirt and not much else, you know, throw some uh, native wildflower seeds down there uh, and you'll get poppies and lupin and, and some beautiful stuff. Uh, and it just, again, a sense of beauty, uh, a sense of aesthetics uh, makes a place more welcoming, uh, which is what wellness centers are really all about. Very cool. And the other thing about uh, the gardening stuff is that uh, obviously there's a, a season that most of the stuff is going to be grown. But there are things that can be brought inside uh, and keep going in the winter, particularly things like herbs. There's a number of herbs that you can, you know, kitchen herbs, that you can keep inside, still use them for culinary purposes, but also just having a little bit of greenery uh, around February is usually feels really good. <laughs> Any other One comments? One more comment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Christina? Hello. Hi. 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 Hi, I'd like to add that uh, the produce from our garden over at in the Inyo County area, yes, mm -hmm. we do donate it to our Salvation Army Food Pantry, Fabulous. and uh, we use it to feed um, our homeless population that comes to the Wellness Center. Mm -hmm. They have cooking classes with recipes on how to use the produce, and uh, it's just an overall wonderful thing to do for the staff and yep. the clients. Yep. Great examples. Great examples. I am so excited to hear how many counties are already doing more of the of this stuff. Those of you who aren't, hopefully you're getting inspired. And again, even those of you who do, hopefully this uh, continues to inspire you and, and gives you some more background for keeping your spirits up and keeping involved. It's absolutely fabulous. Okay. Any other comments? All right, let's move on. Okay, now here we're gonna. We, now we've, we're all excited and we've gotten all inspired and we we'll pat each other on the back on all these great things we did. Now I'm gonna get into some of the tougher stuff, a little bit, maybe a little bit of the downside, but very important things to to know about. Uh, and the first, the slide here is knowing the related regulations. Um, sometimes these laws seem to be in conflict. <laughs> so I want to emphasize the importance of knowing the law. Um, the American with Disabilities Act is, is really number one. I gave you the website there. There are a lot of things involved in there, uh, particularly related to uh, animals, when they can and can't be. What's a psychiatric service dog versus a, a companion dog? Um, but also, uh, if, if there's a whole lot of issues that can come up, not just with animals. If people are allergic to things, you've got to know about that. Um, it, it's all there in the ADA website. Uh, you also do need to be aware of California health and safety codes. Sometimes This includes uh, food safety uh, standards. Uh, any unsafe environment could also be reported to Cal OSHA. Um, if your garden items are for sale, now so far we haven't talked about that. We've mainly been talking about donations, and that's that's oh, they're a little looser on that stuff. But if you're selling anything from your garden, you may have to uh, get a permit. Uh, it is your responsibility to know all these things. There also could be local ordinances and policies, um, and you can usually find them on your county governmental website, or can be attained through the mayor's office or the board of supervisors. The important thing to remember here is that as a general law rule. Federal law trumps state law and state law trumps local ordinances. But again, how these things are interpreted are pretty tricky. I have a PhD and I can't understand the legal writing on half these things. Um, so if you're feeling caught like this says this and this says that and that doesn't quite jive, um, always contact your county council. Every county has a county council. If you don't know who it is, you, you talk to someone on your board of supervisors or in your mayor's office um, and find out. Um, it is they can give you you know the 
the final um, legal interpretation of which law trumps which and how it can be interpreted in a, sp a specific situation. Uh, but I will emphasize again that it is your responsibility to find these things out. Um, so we're going to do a little case study here uh, and talk about, uh, and I really want your opinion here. Okay. Next slide. Come on. Here's a potential legal conflict. Okay, so here's the story. Oh, I just realized there's a typo there. Gosh, I try to be so careful. I usually am pretty good about it. Forgive me, there's an extra A there. Um, I read these things ten times before I give them to Shoshana, <laughs> but you don't see them at all. Okay. A new member of your wellness center brings his dog inside stating that he needs him present to manage his symptoms of mental illness. Another member complains because she is allergic to dogs. And yet another member, here's another typo, I'm sorry. And yet another member states that the dog And we can't hear you. 